welcome viewers to this session. In this session, we will discuss in continuation to the last class. In the last class, what we had discussed to recap for you, we said that a little bit background of man's of philosophy, then we said that who are those thinkers or scholars contributed for the development and establishment of the school known as Mimansa philosophy. Then we said that although there are many scholars contributed for the development of a Mimansa philosophy, but they have their different opinion on many of the issues that we had discussed. And apart from that, we said that, that they also consider that valid knowledge can be acquired through pramana. Pramana means valid source of knowledge. And here also, they had a different opinion. Kumari Lavatta said that we need six pramana, whereas Prabhakara Mimansa said we need five pramanas. According to Prabhakara Mimansa, anupalabdhi or non perception cannot be considered as an independent pramana. Then, further, we find some of the different opinion like on substances, on uh, categories, so and so forth. Moving further, we had discussed what they mean when they talk about that we need two more extra pramanas by adding the list of pramana stated by Nyaya philosophy. In this regard, we had discussed what is anupalabdhi or non perception, and also we had discussed arthapati or postulation. While discussing the arthapati as an independent pramana, we said that that there are two contradictory facts that we find from a proposition and to resolve that contradiction, the cognizer has to postulate a new fact. As a result, the contradiction will resolve. And in this context, we had given an example by stating that Devadatta is a fat man by fasting in the daytime. Also, we have said that orthopathy postulation cannot be reduced to any other pramanas. Much after that, we had discussed how Anupalabdhi is considered as an independent pramana among other pramanas and how Kumari Lavatta establishes that non perception can be considered as an independent pramana, why it cannot be comes under the perception. Then much after that, we said that regarding the theory of validity of knowledge that is Pramanyavada. In Pramanyavada, we had discussed there are two kinds of Pramanyavada that is discussed in Mimansa philosophy and even Sankhya philosophy and many other schools as, as well. In Mimansa philosophy, it is stated that we find two kinds of Pramanyavada. One is Sattva Pramanyavada, another is Parattva Pramanyavada. Sattva Pramanyavada talks about that. Sattva here stands for intrinsic. Pramanyavada is theory of valid knowledge. Sattva Pramanyavada states that a validity and invalidity of a knowledge exist in the matter, which is capable of its production, which is capable to produce many of the effects. I repeat, the validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the matter, because the matter is capable of producing many of the effects. So, that is called Sattva Pramanyavada. Parattva Pramanyavada means, Parattva stands for extrinsic, Pramanyavada is validity. Many of the schools believe that a knowledge will be valid only when there are some external conditions supports to that. For example, now we can see a chair, now we can perceive a chair. Here we find that there is a contact between the object and our sense organs. And the, here the cognizer will be able to recognize the object chair, if some of the conditions will find over there. For example, a minimum distance as the cognizer must have a well vision sight, then there is a sufficient light, so and so forth. Thus, many of the thinkers in different schools believe that the knowledge will be valid or invalid, it depends on the external conditions. In continuation to that, in today class, we will discuss how the different schools 
have their own opinion on the Pramanyavada, on the theory of valid knowledge. In the last class, in very brief, we had stated about the four schools, but today class, in today class, we will discuss in a very elaborate way, why they said so and what are the reason for stating so and whether their argument, their argument means other schools argument differs from Mimansa school, if not differ on which ground they have a commonality. So, all the things we will discuss in detail. Now, coming to the point that Kumarila Bhatta, Kumarila Bhatta is a scholar belongs to Mimansa philosophy. Kumarila Bhatta said there are two kinds of validity, one is Sotya Pramanyavada, another is Paratya Pramanyavada. The Sankhya philosophy said Sotya Pramanya and Sotya Apramanya. The Buddhist philosophy said Paratya Pramanya and Sotya Apramanya. The Naya philosophy said Paratya Pramanya and Paratya Apramanya. Now, as you know that we have two Pramanyavada, Sotya Pramanyavada and Paratya Pramanyavada. On the other hand, we find Sotya Apramanyavada and Paratya Apramanyavada. Here, Sotya stands for intrinsic, Pramanyavada stands for validity. So, it is a intrinsic validity, Sotya Pramanyavada. Sotya Apramanyavada means intrinsic invalidity, Paratya Pramanyavada means extrinsic validity, Paratya Apramanyavada means extrinsic invalidity. So, since we have two kind of Pramanyavada, in permutation and combination, if we do the permutation and combination of these two Pramanyavada, we find there are four and those are known as Sattva Pramanyavada, Paratva Pramanyavada, Sattva Apramanyavada and Paratva Apramanyavada. Now, there are four thinkers, Kumarila Bhatta you find in Mimansa philosophy, then we have a Sankhya philosophy view, then we have a Naya philosophy view and we have a Buddhist philosophy view. There are four schools here we find and they have a different opinion in relation to the validity and invalidity of knowledge. Now, why Kumarila Bhatta said that Sattva Pramanyavada and Paratva Pramanyavada? The reason are as follows, Sattva Pramanyavada means validity of knowledge lies in the matter which is capable of producing effect. Here Kumarila Bhatta says that a matter which is capable of producing different objects, it, it must have validity on its own, otherwise it cannot able to produce any of the effect which have a validity in the outside world. Therefore, they said that prior to the production, we find the validity in that matter. Prior to production of any of the object, we find the validity lies in the matter which is capable of producing the effect. Further, they said that Paratta Pramanyavada, that means once the object is produced, we have a knowledge about that object, because we perceive that object, our sense organs contact to that object. What happens here? Since our sense organs contact to that object, depends on many of these external conditions, which really cause for the not recognizing that object properly. As I said, if there is no proper light, I cannot able to perceive a chair. If the chair is kept in a very distant place from me, I cannot perceive a chair as it can be perceived if it would be near to me. Thus, they said that is the external condition matters to find the invalidity of knowledge. What is validity and invalidity? You have already known that. Validity means there is a new knowledge we acquire about that object and certainly it should not contradict with any other knowledge and must be free from other defects. So, these are the three components stated by Mimansa philosophy. Therefore, they said that the validity of knowledge, knowledge about an object lies in the matter which is capable of producing the effects and once it produces the effects then we have knowledge about that object. Here the validity and invalidity comes because of the external conditions. In other words, once the things are produced, the validity and invalidity of knowledge about that object 
depends on many of the external conditions. And if the external conditions are not supported over there for a cognizer to cognize that object, then it will be turns into invalid knowledge. So, this is the Kumari Lavato stance point. Moving further, the Sankhya philosophy. The Sankhya scholars believe that Sattva Pramanya and Sattva Pramanya, the validity and invalidity of knowledge lie in the matter itself and they argue that if the matter is not valid that any effort will put into it, it cannot able to produce any of this valid knowledge or any of this good effect. If the validity does not lie in the matter, how can we expect that whatever it produce, it has a validity. Therefore, they said that validity and invalidity lie in the matter which is capable of producing the effect. Sotya Pramanyavada, intrinsic validity and intrinsic invalidity. Both validity and invalidity lies in the matter which is capable of producing the effect. They argue that if the matter is invalid, then whatever it produces, it will be invalid. If the knowledge about the matter is invalid, then whatever the effect it produced, certainly it resulted in invalid knowledge. Now, Buddhist thinkers, they said that Pratya Pramanyavada and Sutta Pramanyavada. When they said Paratya Pramanyavada, they said that validity of an object or we can have a validity, we can have a knowledge and that knowledge will be valid when there is an external conditions matters when there is a sufficient amount of light will be there, it should be in a particular distance and so and so forth. So, therefore, according to Buddhist, our knowledge will be valid because it depends on the external conditions. Whenever we recognize, whenever we identify an object, certainly there are external conditions matters, because in darkness we cannot identify an object in darkness we cannot recognize an object. Therefore, validity of knowledge lies or validity of knowledge depends on the external conditions for them. They further said that, that Sutta Apramanyavada, intrinsic invalidity. Why they said? They said that when we cannot claim that a knowledge will be valid when it lies in its matter. Because once it is produced, we do not know its validity or invalidity, because we do not know whether it solves its purpose or not. In the first production of an object, it cannot be cognized as valid or invalid. The reason behind that, they said that once it is produced, we do not know for what purpose, we do not know whether it is fulfill its purpose or not, whether it can be used for the purposes for which it has produced. All the things we can able to know only when we recognize that object, we know how it can solve the purposes and so and so forth. Therefore, validity never lies in the matter, validity can be assessed by the cognizer when there is a contact between sense organs with that object. In that way, they said that invalidity lies in the matter, the invalidity of knowledge that is a Sutta Pramanyavada, the invalidity of knowledge lies in the matter. However, the validity of knowledge can be assessed when there is an external conditions present over there when a cognizer cognizing the particular object. Now, if we see the Nyayaka's stance point, Nyayaka's clearly stated that both validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external conditions. They said that we are not discussing about the matter, because we do not know anything as such in the matter. Once it is produced, then we have a sense organs contacts with that object and of course, once we recognize that object, it is supported by some of the external condition. 
So, therefore, is the external condition really matters for cognizing an object what it is and therefore, they submit the view that both validity and the invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition. Hence, they subscribe the view saying that paratha pramanya and paratha apramanya, both validity and invalidity lie in the external condition. Both validity and invalidity depend on the external condition. Now, let us see how Mimansa reacts to those are the opinion given by or stated by Naya schools, Buddhist schools and uh, Sankhya school. Here Kumarila refutes the view of Sankhya by asking them how the same knowledge can be valid and invalid. Because in Sankhya they said that Sattva Pramanya and Sattva Apramanya both validity and invalidity lie in the matter which is capable of producing the effect. Sankhya standpoint is very clear they said that if something is not capable of producing validity, then how can it produce validity? If the matter is not valid, how can we expect that it produce something valid knowledge? And if the matter is invalid, can we expect something valid knowledge out of it? Here Mimansa, Kumarila Bhatta in specific argues that how can Sankhya say that, that a table is not a table? because Sankhya argues that validity and invalidity lies in the matter in the same time. Then further Kumarila Bhatta asks to Sankhya, is it not that you are contradicting? When you say that both validity and invalidity lie in the matter itself, this is the Kumarila Bhatta reactions towards Sankhya view on Pramanyavada. Now, Partha Sarathi Misra is a another scholars in Mimansa philosophy. Parthasarathi Mishra said that Buddhist claim cannot be accepted, because they are stating that Paratta Pramanya and Sutta Pramanya, validity of knowledge depends on external conditions and invalidity lies in the matter. They said that if one thing can be considered as valid knowledge and that valid knowledge to be established by the help of other valid knowledge and further that valid knowledge has to be established by other another valid knowledge, then it will go in a infinite regress. At no point of time we can claim that these are the external conditions really matters for assessing a knowledge to be valid. Thus, Partha Sarathi Misa claimed that, that if the validity of knowledge is determined by the subsequent knowledge, then it leads to the infinite regress. Further they said, if knowledge is not intrinsically valid, it cannot be validated by any other knowledge. Because here Buddhist claim that, that invalidity of knowledge lies in the matter. Now, how that Partha Sarathi Misra refuted this argument? On the first ground they said that, if something is invalid, at any cost, whatever we try, try to get the valid knowledge out of it, we cannot succeed, because it is intrinsically invalid. Therefore, they said that if knowledge is not intrinsically valid, then it cannot be validated by any other knowledge. If you claim that knowledge is not intrinsically valid and further you say that it depends on the external conditions for cognizing its validity, it is a contradiction. If the knowledge is not valid, how does it matter whether external conditions present or not, because it is not capable of producing the valid knowledge. In this way, Partha Sarathi Misra refutes the claim made by the Buddhist scholars. Now, Kumarila also criticizes Naya views of Pramanyavada, because Nayaka said Paratta Pramanyavada and Paratta Pramanyavada, both validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition. Kumarila Bhatta here rejects the Nayaka's arguments. Here Kumarila Bhatta said that, that if validity and invalidity of knowledge were due to the external conditions, 
then prior to the knowledge of its validity and invalidity, the knowledge would be either neutral or devoid of any logical value. It is a logical argument if you can see that. Nyakos said that validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition or external condition. Now, here Kumail Lavato is asking that if the knowledge is not valid intrinsically, how can you claim or on what basis we can derive some valid knowledge out of that? Is it possible? Further, Kumail Lavato said that if you claim at all, if you are claiming that validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on external condition, it simply means that prior to its production or prior to the external conditions, the matter is itself in a neutral standpoint, it is neither valid nor invalid. Can you claim so? Because Kumail Lapata further argued that we cannot find any kind of knowledge in any stage which have a neutral value. At any point of time, we cannot claim any knowledge as it is a neutral value. If it is so, then Nyakos standpoint cannot be accepted. We cannot accept something saying that validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition. If it is so, then we have to accept, we have to logically accept that prior to the external conditions of validity and invalidity of knowledge, the knowledge was neutral, it is neither positive nor negative. And any point of time, we cannot claim that a knowledge has its neutral value. So, henceforth, Nyakos argument cannot be accepted by Kumari Lavatta. Thus, they said the fact is that we can never experience the neutral knowledge about an object. Further, he said that how many extraneous conditions are required to validate knowledge of an object is not mentioned by Nyakas. Thus, it is erroneous to accept that the validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external conditions. Further, they said that let us assume, let us accept that according to Nyakas, the validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition. But he has not mentioned how many external conditions really matters to cognize the validity and invalidity of knowledge. If there is no fixed number of external condition, then it varies from person to person, time to time and place to place. And hence for whatever is valid for a person may not be accepted by other person. Because it is not the case that two people often agree to cognize an object having the same external conditions. It is not so, because two people may take different accounts of cognizing that object. The two people may differ for accepting the different external conditions for cognizing the object. Therefore, Kumari Lavata strongly refutes the Nyayaka's argument that a knowledge or the validity and invalidity of knowledge depend on the external condition. Here we find knowledge. Knowledge means knowledge about an object, knowledge about a fact, knowledge about an event. That is a knowledge. Here also we find that whenever we talk about knowledge, there are every possibility that we may encounter with illusion. We may think that we have acquired the knowledge, but that is not the real knowledge. That is an illusion. And how do we know that? Because the prior knowledge, when it is rectified by other knowledge or counteracted by other knowledge, we accept that our prior knowledge was an illusion. Thus, in Mimansa philosophy, it is stated that although knowledge and illusion are contradicted, yet they are inseparably related with each other. That is what we find a very famous statement to air is the human, it is the human being who cognizing the object. Here it is stated that when it is not the case that whenever we cognize the object, we know the object as it is in all the time. No, because there are many times we cognize snake as a rope, we cognize 
sell as a silver and many more things. And why it happens? They said that we encounter an object, we identify that object and whatever knowledge we acquire on that time or whatever knowledge we acquire in that time, it is not the valid knowledge because it is counteracted or negated by other kinds of knowledge in later period. And once it is counteracted, once it is contradicted, we could able to know that our previous knowledge was an illusion, was not the valid knowledge. Thus, knowledge and illusion, although they are contradictory in their nature, yet they are inseparably related with each other. In many of the scholars also accept that illusion is itself a knowledge. Of course, this is not a valid knowledge, however, it is a knowledge. In that way, one have to understand that what is illusion and what is knowledge and how illusion differs from knowledge. On the other hand, how knowledge differs from illusion. As you can see, there is a logical relation between knowledge and illusion. We have a knowledge, it is counteracted in the later period, therefore, we accept that our prior knowledge is an illusion. So, in this way, knowledge and illusion both are inseparably related with each other. Now, we will discuss what is nature of illusion. How can we understand the concept illusion? It is the philosophy which tells you that how to understand the concept illusion and no other discipline as such can able to explain what is illusion and why we have illusion. So, this is the beauty of philosophy. Once you understand the philosophy, once you have interest in philosophy, then you may be explore many of the new concept which you may not have focused or which you may not have known even in your past philosophy argues to understand a particular concept or a thing in its true nature in that sense. Now, Mimansa philosophy try to explain what is illusion. They said that knowledge is, is itself illuminated and eternally real. According to Mimansa philosophy, knowledge is self illuminated and eternally real. Once we say this is the knowledge, when we can say, when we can claim that we have acquired knowledge in our general understanding. When we can claim that we have acquired knowledge, we can claim that we acquire a knowledge only when we know that object, we know what it is, we identify that object of having its essential and accidental qualities, we know what are the purposes for which it has produced and how it can be used for those purposes, so and so forth. And if you add further, you can say that how that object is different from other objects. So, if you can know all these features, then you can able to claim that yes, I know that object, therefore, I have a knowledge about that object. And henceforth, we can claim that I acquire the knowledge about that object. In the same way, when you say that you have a knowledge about a particular concept. That means, you have understood the concept and it is sure that your understanding should not be contradicted further by any other knowledge. So, in those grounds, we can claim that we acquire the knowledge about the object, about the concept, about the fact or an event. Therefore, once you have a knowledge, it is self illuminated, it is eternal because the knowledge of the chair, say knowledge of the illusion, it remain as it is, it will not change further. However, the cognizer who cognizing that knowledge may not exist eternally in this earth, because he may be in the chain of birth and death. But the concept as such, but the knowledge as such, it is eternal, it is self illuminated. As I said, the knowledge of a chair, the knowledge of a game, the knowledge of water, it remain eternal, it will not change, it does not fall in the cycle of 
birth, progress and destruction. But it is the cognizer who really fall in the trap. He or she cognizes the object and by the time passing, he may be fall in the trap of birth, growth and death. But it is true and eternally true that the concept remain as it is eternally. It was in the past, it is in the present, it will be in the future. The concept of water, how people perceived water in the past is perceiving the same way in the present and it will be in the future, it will not change. But those who are perceiving the water, they may change, they may subject to birth and death. Therefore, they say that it is a very clear statement they made that knowledge itself is self illuminated and it is eternally true and it exists for all the time. Moving further, they said illusion is the understanding of one thing as another. Just few minutes back, I said that what is illusion, but according to Mimansa philosophy, they said that illusion is the understanding of one thing as another thing. That means, we have a knowledge about an object and we consider that we acquire the knowledge about that object, but later it is counteracted <coughs> or it is contradicted by other knowledge. Therefore, our prior knowledge may not be a valid knowledge and hence the prior knowledge will be treated as an illusion. Why it is an illusion? Because we identify an object what it is not. We identify a rope as a snake. We identify a rope not as a rope, but as a snake. Therefore, the knowledge about that object say rope is an illusion. Now, I believe it is clear to you what is knowledge and what is illusion and how these two concepts are related with each other and how these two concepts cannot be separated from each other. An example I said here, identifying a rope as snake is an illusion. In this case, the contact between the sense organs with the object cannot be ruled out. How really happens? How really illusion appears for a cognizer? Why a cognizer at all cognize something what it is not. Here they have explained by giving an example, they said that a cognizer cognizing a rope as a snake, whenever he or she is cognizing that object, there is a sense object contact, there is a sense organs contact between that object and the sense organs. Here we find there is a contact between sense organs of the cognizer and the object and that cannot be ruled out. Of course, there are some external conditions matter to perceive that object. Further they said that the knowledge of snake is neither due to the perception nor due to the inference, but certainly due to the memory. They very clearly said and interestingly they presented, they said that whenever there is an illusion, it is not because of perception nor because of inferences, but because of memory as well. They clearly said that the knowledge of snake is neither due to perception nor due to inference, but certainly due to the memory. Why it is so? Because whenever the cognizer is perceiving the object, say let us say rope, in that time he may find some of the features which common to both rope and snake and therefore, he, he could able to recapitulate the same sort of object having some of the features like snake. So, therefore, the concept snake has remembered by the cognizer and in that time in the moment when he perceives the object rope, it reflects in his mind. Therefore, it is the memory which compels the cognizer to cognize the object which is presented before him as a snake, but not as a rope. Because here he perceived the object and he finds some of the features which overlaps even in a another object, let us say snake. And the concept snake was in his mind in that time. And because of that 
object lies in his mind immediately claim that this is not a rope, but as a snake. Because if you remember, we said that we cognize an object because of its features, because of its qualities. But here what happens is that the mind which immediately reflect the concept snake and fortunately the snake have the some of the features which he finds in the object which is presented before him. Therefore, mind compels him the impression of the object snake in his mind compels the cognizer to claim the object as a snake instead of a rope. Thus, they said that the knowledge of snake is neither due to perception nor due to inference, but certainly due to the memory. The snake arises in cognizer's mind because of the defects in his or her visual organs, which may occur due to the extraneous condition. There is another condition here they have described that whenever the cognizer try to perceive the object, because of the external conditions, the cognizer may not able to cognize the object clearly, but however, he can cognize some of the features of it, but he cannot cognize the full object as it such. On the other hand, the characteristics of snake are remembered by the cognizer. There are three things very clearly stated and logically these arguments are very logical in nature. They said that it is a illusion when a cognizer cognizes a rope as a snake, this is an illusion, because it is counteracted in the later period. And how it happened? Why this illusion happens? They said that whenever the cognizer tries to cognize an object, some of the external conditions may not be well presented over there or some of the external conditions may not be supporting the cognizer to cognize the object. The first argument, the second argument is the said that whenever he tries to cognize an object, he finds some of the features of the, of the object. The third argument they said that because of some of the features he finds and he recapitulates whatever he had the earlier experiences and he found that there is a another object known as snakes of having so and so features. And in that time it reflects the object snake in his mind of having so and so features, which is presented in the object before him. As a result the impression of that snake in his mind claims that identify that object as a snake. I repeat there are three claims it is made. The first claim is that the cognizer tries to cognize the object where there are no sufficient support from the external conditions. The second is that he tries to identify that object which is presented before him of having so and so features. And the third one those features he recapitulated whatever he had in his previous experiences and found that snake had so and so features. And now the concept snake in his memory and here memory compels the cognizer to cognize the object as a snake, but not as a rope. These are the three conditions which resulted the cognizer to claim an object as a different than what it is. This is the result where a cognizer cognizes a rope as a snake. In this way illusion appears. Rope is the object of vision, while snake is in mind. Illusion is resulted because of the confusion between two types of knowledge. The first knowledge is that he tries to identify an object which is presented before him, that is due to the sense organs contact directly and further there is another knowledge which he could able to recapitulate in his memory. Thus, they said illusion is resulted because of the confusion between two types of knowledge. One is perceptual knowledge which is presented before him, another was memory knowledge which he recapitulated consciously. It is due to the failure in discriminating one knowledge from another. Thus, all illusions are subjective in nature. 
any illusion you talk about, it is a subjective in nature. For example, you are going in a straight road, you are driving a car, you find that in a long distance, it seems that road is going down or the road looks up, it is an illusion. As you go close to that road, you find that the road is very clean, it is a straight, it is neither up nor down. But from a distance, since the road is very straight, due to some or other reason, you identify that after 5 minutes, the road will be off or down. In many cases, in the summer time, from a long distance, if you see there is a mirage, you find there is water, but that is not really water. It may be the some of the dust particles, which called as mirage. So, it is an illusion to identify mirage as water to identify a straight road as a up or down road, to identify a snake as a silver. In many cases, due to some of the external conditions, we identify a cell as a silver, because some of the features of silver lie in the cell and also we find the inverse relation. And in all the cases, you find these three conditions. The first condition, the cognizer perceive the object and because of some of the external conditions, the cognizer could not able to perceive the object as it is. But however, he tries to cognize the object by the help of some of the features which he finds in that object. In the same time, there are some kind of object he could able to recapitulate with some of these features. And because of the compels of the mind, he able to claim the object what it is reflected in his memory, but not what he has perceived. As a result, the illusion appears. Like illusion, we find error. It is a similar concept, error. When you cognize x not as an x, then it is an error. When we cognize a cow is not a cow, then it is an error. When you cognize snake as a rope is also an error, because what is expected is that we as a cognizer, we have to cognize snake as a snake, but not snake as a rope. And because of the some commonal features between snake and rope, we are in a confusion that whether to claim that object which is presented before us is a snake or a rope. Therefore, error is also subjective. Why it is subjective? It is not the case that all the cognizer will identify the snake as a rope for all the time of having the same conditions, external conditions. So, it differs from person to person and even place to place. Therefore, they said that like illusions, error are also subjective in nature. Having a cognition which is not answering the object is called error. Having a cognition, here we are trying to have a cognition on that object which is presented before us. Therefore, they said having a cognition which is not answering to the object or not answering the object is called error or khyati vada. When they try to explain the concept error, they, they claim that error and illusion, maybe these two concepts are overlapping with each other, but one must understand that illusion means there is an idea or a concept one believes in it and later finds that it is not true, it is not the valid knowledge. In case of error, it is a mistake. It is a mistake by the individual, not mistake does not lie in the object, it is mistake because of the individual. Even illusion also, illusion because of the individual, individual or the cognizer believes an object in a different way, what it is not. Here a cognizer understands or believes a object in a different features, what it is not. A cognizer tries to cognize an object with different features, what it is not. Therefore, it is the responsible of a cognizer, he has to or she has to cognize the object correctly. And therefore, both illusion and error lie in the subject or it depends on the cognizer and henceforth it is subjective in nature. Thus, they claim that whenever a cognizer 
tries to identify an object and not able to identify the object as it is, then the error lies. Thus, the said having a cognition which is not answering the object is called error or khyatibada. The concept khyatibada is very clearly known to many of the schools and many of the schools contributed on the concept khyatibada theory of error, because they believe that to cognize something not necessarily resulted the valid knowledge, because of many of the conditions. Now, some of the conditions you know and some of the conditions we will discuss, whenever the situation demands we will discuss, but broadly if you see khyatibada are of two types, one is asat khyatibada, another is sat khyatibada. Asat khyatibada talks about the madhyamika schools, madhyamika schools is a school from Buddhism, a madhyamika school is also known as sunyavadins, those who believe that neither mind nor the composite world is real. According to them nothing is real, because everything is in a momentary process, everything is in the process of constant flux. So, thus they said that neither the mind nor the external world is real, this is their standpoint. Madhyamika school accept the asat khyatibada, they said that everything is unreal and according to them error lies in the cognition of non-existence, it is the non-existence where the error lies, because whenever you try to cognize the object, that object may not remain as it is, it is changed, because every moment things are changing and therefore, they said that neither mind nor the object is real in this world, error lies in the cognition of non-existence. Here non-existence is cognized as existence and again cognition of unreal is apprehended as real, we cognize cell as a silver. There are two things Madhyamika school highlighted, the first thing they said that everything is in the process of constant flux, nothing is remain as fixed, because they believe in the momentariness. Therefore, they said that neither mind nor the empirical world is real, everything is unreal. And we as a cognizer, we try to identify non-existence as an existence. Let us say, now I am trying to identify say an object say table, whenever we try to identify an object table, immediately it changes. Therefore, I as a cognizer or me as a cognizer, I identify the non-existence of table as a table. Whenever we try to identify that object, the object may not remain as it is, it changes and the illusion according to him lies when the non-existence is cognized as the existence and further they said that the cognition of unreal is apprehended as real. In this way they describe the concept asat khyatibada, the example we cognize cell as a silver and in this case also illusion appears, this is the theory of error asat khyatibada. In the next class we will discuss sat khyatibada and how other schools contributed in it, thank you.